At the end of the war, the Germans were adamant that the sculpture of the crucified Canadian soldier was simply black propaganda. Their formal protest went to the highest level. In January 1919, the complaint reached Sir Robert Borden, Canada's Prime Minister. He asked Sir Edward Kemp to investigate the matter. Kemp, the Minister of Overseas Military Forces, was the driving force behind the search for witnesses. At first, Kemp's investigation went well. He found eyewitnesses, like Private George Barry, who could furnish every detail of the incident. On the 24th day of April in the year of our Lord, 1915, I was a private in the 13th Canadian Battalion, Royal Highlanders of Canada. We took up a position in the rear and to the right of St. Julian. I saw a small party of Germans about 50 yards away. I lay still, and in about half an hour they left. I saw what appeared to be a man in British uniform. I was horrified to see that the man was literally crucified, being fastened to the post by eight bayonets. He was suspended about 18 inches from the ground, the bayonets being driven through his legs, shoulders, throat, and testicles. At his feet lay an English rifle, broken and covered with blood. Barry could even identify the victim as a Canadian sergeant through the insignia on his uniform. But as other eyewitnesses came forward, alarming inconsistencies began to emerge in their accounts. Private Arthur Boole also claimed to have witnessed the crucifixion of a sergeant. Sergeant J. Wilson was crucified to a barn door with bayonets in April 1915. But Boole's service record in Canadian archives reveals that he only enlisted on the 1st of May and did not reach the front until 1916. So Boole could not have witnessed the crucifixion he described. Why would a soldier have given false testimony? It might be as simple as um, getting attention. Um, we have accounts, for example, of um, soldiers who claim to be coming back from Belgium telling stories about German battlefield atrocities. But we actually have no idea whether this man was there or not. Uh, in all likelihood, he's never been anywhere further than Aldershot. Adrian Gregory believes that in the countryside around Ypres, there are clues that might explain the emergence of a crucifixion story in April 1915 these troops are being exposed to the visual culture of Belgian Catholicism with its wayside calvaries and crucifixes which they see going to and from the trenches and then add on top of that the terrible deaths incurred amongst the troops through the German use of poison gas uh, which are effectively as horrific an idea as crucifixion and then on top of all of that the fact that this is more or less occurring over Easter. And personally, I think the emergence of a story about crucified soldiers um, is essentially really quite unsurprising. But just as the Canadian inquiry seemed to have stalled, new witnesses came forward. Like Private Barry, Private Leonard Vivian of the 3rd Middlesex also pointed to Saint-Julien as the site of the alleged crucifixion. I was in charge of number one stretcher section, which made several trips bringing in wounded from the line in front of Saint-Julien. We had made about five journeys, and on the sixth journey I saw on the right-hand side of the road, on a barn door, what appeared to me to be a Canadian sergeant crucified to the door. There was a bayonet through each hand, and his head was hanging forward as though he were dead or unconscious. I did not stop as the army was retiring, and I had a wounded soldier in my care. I learned from some Canadians the same day that this sergeant was a Canadian, 
and had been crucified for protecting an old woman. With Lance Corporal William Metcalf, Sir Edward Kemp thought he had finally found a compelling eyewitness. Metcalf was an American citizen who had heard that war had been declared whilst on holiday in Canada. He enlisted in the Canadian Army. Of course, he was underage, but back then, you know, young adventure, right? That's what, you know, perception of war was uh, just a big adventure. In September 1918, the Allies had attacked the heavily defended Hindenburg Line at Arras in France. Metcalfe's men were pinned down by machine gun fire. Waving a signal flag, William Metcalfe had dared walk in front of a passing tank to direct it towards enemy gun emplacements. His hip was smashed and the canteen was shot off and kilts were all shot up and helmet was riddled. And amazing, really, why he didn't get killed. Well, I asked him uh, one time <laughs> why he didn't get in the tank and he said, he said damn things were death traps and you wouldn't get in one. William Metcalfe was awarded the Victoria Cross, Britain's highest military decoration. Kemp thought the testimony of someone with his exemplary military record could not be doubted. On or about April 23rd, my platoon was proceeding along the St. Jean Road when I noticed a soldier pinned to a barn door with bayonets. There was a bayonet through each wrist. His head hung forward on his breast as though he were dead. I could not see any bullet wound, but did notice the maple leaf badges on his collar. We were told later that this man belonged to the 16th Canadian Battalion. The platoon sergeant, whose name I cannot remember, examined the body and we moved on. But even in the war hero's account, there was a serious flaw. It lay in the location, the Saint-Jean Road. Saint-Jean was never captured by the Germans and could not have been the site of a crucifixion. Privates Vivian and Barry had identified a much more likely site. Saint-Julien was a village that fell to the Germans on the evening of the 24th of April. Could Metcalfe have simply confused Saint-Jean with Saint-Julien? That's very understandable to uh, get confused on, the, on a road. But you always remember the incident, what, what you saw, you didn't, you know, like a man who won the Victoria Cross, a mil military medal twice, wounded six different times. Uh, he had no reason to lie. Uh, what he saw is what he saw. Throughout 1919, the German Foreign Ministry kept pressing the British government to produce the evidence for a crucified soldier. When they received no reply, they sensed the Allied case was weak. Behind the diplomatic language, their meaning was clear. Put up or shut up. The Foreign Office has the honor to beg the Swiss legation to state whether the British government has communicated the material requested by the German government. Should the reply be in the negative, the Swiss legation is requested to have the matter brought to the recollection of the British government. In January 1920, the British finally sent Vivian and Metcalfe statements. They knew the evidence was not conclusive, but it was all they had. The Allies had failed to identify the victim. The witness statements were inconsistent. The Germans denied their troops were anywhere near the locations mentioned. They appeared to have scored a propaganda victory. Sir Edward Kemp knew his inquiry had failed, but he was furious when he learned his government intended to label the allegations as not proven. What the officials were doing by telling the Germans this was calling into question the depositions of the eyewitnesses. And Kemp was very familiar with their reports. He probably thought that it had happened. And even if it hadn't, we couldn't embarrass our own soldiers. The sculpture, Canada's Golgotha, 
became something of an embarrassment. It was withdrawn from public display and, until recently, locked in a vault in the Canadian War Museum. But was the record of the German army in the First World War as clean as it appeared? <laughs> 